we'll get started. So welcome everyone to Numbers Therapy episode Onse, episode 11. What do you analyze in a bear market? And, you know, today's guest, like we were debating a little bit about what to That's call crazy. this, but like the real thought process behind it, of course, was what does an analyst do in a bear market, right? Like, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your attention? How do you think about all that? So, you know, just as framing and reminders, the purpose, uh, you know, of numbers therapy, of course, is to talk through the macro, bring on and showcase our experts in here. So, uh, and more from, from a more specific vantage point. Uh, so that everyone can understand how and how all the big things fit together, make better decisions with NFTs and other investments oh, using a balanced perspective, learn about or from some of our people in here and get different Sorry. perspectives. And then also learn about different areas and opportunities that exist out there too and different ways of thinking. So um, the reminder I always give for anybody familiar, uh, even if you're not, is there are different levels of folks that we have in here for every topic that we have. So we need to make sure, not just me, but like we all need to make sure that everybody's comfortable and along for the full ride so they can get everything out of this. Um, so if you have a question in your mind, if you think it's a dumb question, it's not. I'm sure others have the same <laughs> yeah, question. So think? please do ask. We have two channels in here. We have office hours chat where, you know, uh, Poop Pip puts memes and everyone else uh, puts funny stuff. And then we have guest questions. If you have any question whatsoever about an acronym, about a word, about anything, um, please drop it into guest questions. Of course, if you have more, you know, advanced questions, put them in there as well. It's for everybody, but we want to make sure everybody's along for the ride. Uh, one other important note and disclaimer, of course, is none of what you hear in here is financial advice. It is all opinions. So without further ado, today we've got our favorite chart and daily data man on. So funny enough, I got to sit next to him in NYC for NFT NYC at a at a Korean barbecue place, unknowingly, at which point we realized and we kind of hugged and had a pretty awesome time. Um, he has an interesting background, not in trading or greater finance that I'm sure he'll talk about, uh, but has ma rapidly made himself into an awesome data-driven decision-making machine, which he openly even shares with MVHQ and the greater online world. Uh, it's calling in from Belgium, I'm guessing, um, where he hails from. I think Antwerp, but he'll, he'll comment on that soon. And might be our, our main Belgian representative in here, too. Him and I have had a lot of conversations on voice and in DMs, and we love to debate our theory, market views, and a bunch of other things. And I've also, also constantly tried to get him to bet on weird things, which he never takes the, bet, the bait on ever. Um, but he's, a, he's become a really good friend as well. So please welcome Linko, man. Linko, what's going on, dude? What up, what up? Yeah, I'm not taking any bets with you. Um... I know that's a trap. I'm not taking the bait, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm calling in from Belgium, Antwerp. And as you said, like it was awesome meeting you in NFT NYC. Like we were sitting next to each other, had no idea we like who he was and who I was. And then all of a sudden like, oh, I'm Aslo and I'm Link. Oh, wait, wait you're Aslo here? Oh, fuck. And that's when we uh, really start talking. And that's how I, I think we were start talk about like oh we should do an office hours or something together like do something <laughs> together because yeah we we talk a lot like we we sometimes have different views on the market but like if each discussion leads to some exciting news or exciting views like that's what why you start talking with people to share different views and that's how you adapt your own view and that's just awesome in this space so really yeah. glad to be here yeah, yeah, it's awesome, and I, I appreciate the compliment somewhere in not taking a bet with me. I think it's uh, over overextended, over-exaggerated, but I do appreciate it. Also, as a side comment, and this is not from the Belgium Tourism Board, but at that dinner, Linko was trying to convince convince everyone how uh, the Belgian community is, is a bunch of good-looking people. So if anybody's single and is looking to go out there, you might have a, you know, a host or someone who could take you around or something like that. So, okay. So let's start with maybe background first. So we all know you as the, the daily data guy and analyst, but can you tell everyone like what, what exactly were you doing before? You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to hear that connection and share, you know, part of the story that you shared at, at dinner with everyone. So, yeah, originally I started out studying as a civil engineer at university. Oh. Then I switched over to uh, civil engineering architecture. So becoming an architect and then I was an architect. So for the first few years that I worked, I was just doing architect stuff, drawing buildings, building buildings. And it's 
It's something completely different. It's not not really data driven, but the civil engineering background is maybe a bit of my mathematical link. Uh, my dad's a civil engineer as well. My mother did pure math. So I do have a little bit of a math background and that's why I somewhat have a love for numbers. But in the past few years before NFTs and, and crypto, I completely was out of that sort of branch. I just was focusing on drawing stuff, designing stuff, not really using my numbers brain, but more my artistic brain. And yeah, how I then got into NFTs, really how I got into crypto is a bit of a, a weird way that my, uh, my girlfriend's mom asked me to, uh, if she should invest in crypto or not. And I was like, hold on. Uh, I've heard some sketchy stuff about crypto. Let me just look at it before you invest, before you lose all your money. And after like a few days, I was like, damn, this is this is awesome. I, I should get into this myself. That's that's really funny, actually. That also doesn't sound like an unfamiliar story. But then again, you're you're sitting around right now, you know, with, with our big sketchy group here, right? So uh, <laughs> they just become friendlier, right, together. So that, that's really, really good context. So, I mean, what, what was your, your immediate reaction beyond, of course, you know, you thought it was interesting. What, was, what, was, what were you seeing? Like, what was the hook that you saw? What was it that you thought, you know, presented an opportunity? Also, what did you report back to your, I think you said your girlfriend's wife, is I think what you said? What did you report back to them? Like, what was your original thought process? So, my original thought process was like, hmm, how, how is this, like, how can you predict this? How can you... Well, not really predict, but how can you sort of see where price is going? And then I started watching a lot of videos on how to analyze the market and read a lot about it. And then sort of saw all these mathematical links in the graphs and see how everything relates to certain numbers and how you can sort of get a, let's say, not gamble the market, but increase your odds to being like 60% correct or 70% correct. And that's how I was like, damn, this is... This is super interesting. I love maths. I love finding these numbers in just the environment. So that's how I sort of started getting more and more into it. And then I uh, went back to my uh, my girlfriend's mom, and I was like, "Well, um, this is this is super interesting. I think there's a lot of potential for this. So we should start uh, investing." And this was I was still a very beginner at the time as well. So I started investing in what was it? I think I joined uh, late April, early May of 2021. So just before the top of um, when we went into the summer crash. So we re rode up a little bit. So super happy numbers go up, me happy. And then uh, numbers go down, me less happy. But I was, I was positive then. I was like, yeah, I'm in for the long run. This will go up again. This is just an opportunity to get in lower, especially for someone who joined late. This is just amazing opportunity. And that's how we did it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing that I like really enjoyed learning about your background that I think is very cool here, right, is that you didn't come from, you know, a financial background, a trading background. You know, yes, numbers, like you said, you had some math background, but it's kind of it seems like it's this melding between like your numbers background and, you know, I guess with being an architect also, you had to be like very precise and very measured with how you did things. Right. Which probably allowed you to plan out appropriately. So I love that story. I think it's also a good story because it just shows you know, someone who's kind of become one of the best out there, right, in terms of daily data analysis and using numbers that didn't even come from that at all. So it kind of suggests to me that, you know, that's very viable for anybody to, to do it if they want to do it. So, um, wh so what was that mindset, I guess? The question I have is, so obviously skill perspective, you have the, the math background, you know, you have maybe the precision background, but there's like a mindset shift that exists here too, right? You know, so, so it's not just, you know, you want to you want to take seventy percent edge bets, for instance, and and you, you plan out and you run the numbers and all that good stuff. But like you said, thirty percent of the time, in, in that case, you lose, right? So, how did you start to think about that? How did you start to wire your mindset for both yourself, for your girlfriend's mom, accounting for the fact that sometimes you're going to lose, and, and and you know, as a result of that, like how do you stay stable, you know, uh, and, and balanced? How did you approach that originally? My original thought really was like, I'm in for this for investing. Uh, this is when I was originally like crypto based. Um, so I thought like, okay, I'm just going to uh, 
uh, look for these dip opportunities when the price is heading like a small retracement, uh, looking really to Fibonacci numbers. And I was like, okay, this is a good opportunity to buy a bit in. And then if price dropped, it was okay. So I'm, I really wasn't looking for trading rather than just, I was looking for investing. But when I then went over to NFTs later in the year, uh, which was around like, uh, 20, like October, I, I think late September, early October of 2021. So I'm a bit late to the whole party, but still somewhat early. We're all early. But um, that's that was a completely different mindset compared to the crypto investing um, theory. So I started out by just flipping uh, stuff and just saying, okay, well, I flip profit, I wait for profit, and then you take profit and you go on to the next thing. But it's a, a completely different mindset compared to an investing, like a, a trader mindset is you need to make sure, okay, am I in profit? Am I not in profit? Do I think it will go up? Do I think it will go down? If I think it's going down and I'm in a loss already, should cut my losses, go on to the next trade. Whereas if you're an investor, you're just like, okay, well, it doesn't matter if it's going down because I do believe in this project long term. But I did have a real shift then from uh, investing into crypto to only holding ETH at one point and then starting to go completely into NFTs. And I was starting out um, as I did originally start out as a, a flipper, a trader on Solana NFTs. And then I went over to ETH NFTs. And then I was a bit like, okay, maybe I should start investing more in NFTs. So I bought a couple of questionable um, NFTs. I bought the top of um, only one fours, I believe. I held that to um, sub one ETH, uh, sadly enough. So a big portion of my ETH was locked up in that. So I ended up with, so I, I built up my portfolio, I started with like a thousand dollar investment. I built up my portfolio flipping Solana NFTs to about, uh, I believe it was six ETH. I invest the six ETH into the only one and I held that one. I thought, oh, well, this is going to be the new best NFT, um, funny enough. And I held it all the way down to sub one ETH, but I did lock up most of my ETH and then how do you start from 0.2 ETH, which was all I had left and I didn't want to put more money into it. But I was like, okay, I have this much money left. What can I do with it to make more? You cannot be an investor with 0.2 ETH. So I became a flipper. And that's how I sort of shifted my mindset. I knew, I realized my loss with the, the only one, but I still had hopes that I, if I held on to it, that the price would go up again, maybe one day. So that's why I didn't sell it and use that eat, which would have been way better to just take my loss and then rotate it all into flipping, making more. So I just held on to it, um, believed that maybe one day it could go up again and then I didn't have to realize my loss, which was still somewhat painful for me because I worked hard for that eat. And then I started with the 0.2 eat and just started going, okay, Mint this, instantly flip it for a little bit of profit. Mint the next thing, instantly flip it for a little bit of profit. And my mindset really was like, okay, I don't wait for reveals. I don't wait for anything special. I don't hope on anything special. Am I in a little bit in profit? I take the profit. I don't be greedy. I just take, see small profit, take the small profit and all the small profits add up over time. And that's how I really got into the flipping stuff. And at the time I wasn't an analyst or anything. I just watched Moby, saw something pop up on Moby, saw some notable wallets minted, minted myself, saw I was in profit, instantly sell it. And that's how I really went up to, uh, by the end of the year from 0.2 E to like 10 E or something. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good story. And I appreciate you also sharing like, you know, a, a quote unquote mistake that you made, right? Because it's very easy for anybody to look at this and say, you know, he in your case, or, or for many people, does such a great job with analysis, probably never misses, whatever. But it, it's nice to hear, have that debunked and see that like, it's okay to make mistakes. And sometimes, sometimes you don't even make a mistake, you have the right strategy, but it doesn't pan out, right? So I guess the, the related question I have is, do you remember that time, <clears throat> that time period where it went from six down to sub one? And I don't know if you remember, but do you remember what you were kind of feeling like and what it what it took for you to kind of let's let's say like mentally recover from that to get to the next phase? Like, 
and what did you do there? Did you just step away from for a little bit and like take a breath? Did you just see it kind of bleeding every day and everything? You're like, fuck, it's bleeding a little bit. Like, what was that period like if you happen to remember? It was the fuck, it's bleeding. Uh, that's how I felt. And each time I was like, oh, four eat, maybe now is the is the bottom for the next little bounce upward, healthy retrace is what I told myself all the time. And then when it dipped below one eat floor price, I was just telling myself, okay, well, uh, this was also like peak bear market, I think, well, bearish markets um, in like end November. So I was just telling myself, okay, I'm just going to take my money back out, see how much I have in, in solid, l loose eat, liquid eat, and then I will start from there. So that point, I just took the decision, take my loss, use the money to reinvest into new stuff, and then we will see what happened. Because I saw a lot of people also talking like, oh, I should have sold all my NFTs back at this one point in September, but now I'm holding all of them. I'm down 40, 60%. And I was then at that point, I was like happy. I was saying, yes, I am liquid. I have all my ETH again. Uh, I have almost no NFTs. I was just holding the MVHQ pass. And this at this point in November, I was extremely happy. But then we all know we rotated into uh, January. And this is... January was my biggest shift in my total mindset and how I am today because I realized like I had all my liquid so I was extremely happy that I had liquid for mints but in January almost no mints were profitable the play in January was having bought NFTs in November December having bought NFTs in the dip and when I look back on it I was like of course this makes sense I bought crypto in the dip why didn't I buy um, NFTs in the dip? It's the same principle. And then I started noticing more collections just pumping. And I realized, okay, well, it's time for me to do something else. Just watching Moby, minting anything that pops up on Moby, it's not worth it. It's not going to work forever. I need to find my place into the NFT space. I need to find what I'm good at and do something that I will not just be forgotten and at this point i also thought like i need to put in the time and be do something that i um would be proud of looking back on it yeah. and i that's just my that that was my main shift of i need to do something that i know okay in when i look back on it i gave my everything at that period and i'm proud of what i've achieved in that during that time and just sitting behind my PC the entire time and watching Moby, uh, that wasn't it for me. That was just wasn't it. I was the, and then I was just watching it. I noticed some stuff. Uh, the good mints I missed, of course, by having also my architect job, and then the the bad ones. Those were the ones that I minted, and then just started making a track record, started holding an Excel file with all my NFT, all my trades that I did, all my mints that I did, how I was feeling at the time, what have I eaten or not, did I work out that day, uh, did I sleep well, um, how was my emotional state, like keeping track of all those things. And that's when I started like seeing stuff, started realizing what I needed to change and that's how I really made my shift. That's great. That's great context that, you know, the stuff that nobody sees outwardly necessarily. And the one other thing that kind of strikes me in what you said, and, you know, I sense some of this anyway, since, since we've talked a bunch, but, you know, it's kind of like shades of gray to some extent, right? Like, you know, there's like, the, there's a spectrum that it feels like almost exists, right? Where like on one side of the spectrum is trading, which is kind of more flipping, right? Which is just like very, very short time horizon. At the other end of the spectrum is like long investing, right? Which would be kind of multi-year. And then there's kind of maybe this place in between, right, which probably would be categorized more as investing, but it's investing in like a tighter time horizon. So for instance, like you said, November, December was maybe a good time to buy projects at a discount. And you probably could have exited maybe in like January, February, whatever it was, right, whatever your time horizon was or, or held a little bit past that. So it, it, it's interesting because, you know, it, they're all shades of something similar, like skill set wise, it's not much different, but it's a huge advantage, like like you're kind of suggesting if you have the approach that you're taking to be able to extend out the time horizon where it's now not reliant on having the best bot or being the fastest at the computer and always, you know, at hyper urgency and, and all that good stuff. I, I totally understand how you landed there. And uh, thank you for sharing that. It makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so 
I'll, I'll get to you know a, a strengths and weaknesses question later. I'm very curious to hear that from you because I love how how you kind of like iteratively develop yourself, right? You, you find a problem, you figure out how you can solve out of it, and, and you know you adapt. But it, let's talk about the current market now, which is you know the main focus of today. And as we all know, it's it's a bit funny right now, and there's only yeah, you know, there's only so much one could analyze possibly on a daily basis. Like obviously, lots of projects out there. But they all only move so much, and you, of course, need a certain amount of action to be able to trade a project effectively, right? Like if it only goes up two percent, up and down two percent, three percent, especially at ETH being a thousand dollars, like it's not going to have enough action, right, to be able to do something. So, in the current state, like, how do you think about your time? Like, are you are you spending your time looking from a bigger picture? Are you testing theories and like running, you know, mini test trades to see what works and what's not? Like, how are you thinking about your time currently? Um, I'm going to be honest that for my time nowadays, I I only spend a smaller amount of time on NFTs. Um, there are like the current market is um, very hot potato, in my opinion. So there is a project, it pumps and it's basically giving around, in my opinion, to the same amount of people who are trading this nowadays. They are all just giving around the some NFTs and the ones that miss the mint are the ones that maybe buy it and then hope for a rise. And then the ones that minted it are like, yes, instantly sell it off. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes complete sense. So uh, you think it's a little tight. So I guess what you're really saying also is are you spending more time on crypto or are you spending more time on building? Like how are you allocating your time then if not NFTs currently, cause it's a little bit tricky, let's say. Did we get rugged? I think we might've gotten rugged. Linko, are you still there? Oh, I was muted. My bad, my bad. I, I, had, uh, I was coughing earlier, so I may have uh, pushed my mute button. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good it's a good time to call it to everybody how you are a trooper for making sure you're coming on also because linko post nft nyc was you know, quite banged up actually you know covid wise and is now powerfully recovering so very very cool um that you that you stuck with that and, and you were able to make it on by the way so thank you but yeah pl please keep going if you were saying something otherwise i could ask a, a question to, to yeah linko. so um basically i've been like i've been what it's not that I have stopped watching NFTs. I've been like on the side of my screen. I always have NFT nerds open. I always have my notable wallets. I always have Moby open for mints and stuff. So I, I am I am constantly watching it, but I think it's a numbers game right now. And you need to mint uh, almost each one that somewhat looks promising. You need to mint the same amount or something from all of them and hope that if you keep doing this, that one of them is going to be profitable. I've seen some people, even here in MVHQ, like HK Gambler doing amazingly well, and some other people as well. Like I see a lot of people making a lot of profits, but you need to be consistent in what you do. You can't skip one because that could just be the one that's going to make profit enough to make back all the other ones you invested in. And for me, that's a bit scary. I don't like minting, to be honest. I, I love trading secondary. I find it way more safer. And the secondary action is somewhat on the, the smaller size. As you say, you need to factor in your royalties. You need to factor in your gas. Uh, what's, what's the percentage? How much can you profit? And so once I, I look at something and I see, okay, maybe this is starting to get to a certain secure level, it could be that it's already over or the once volume is gone nowadays in a collection, it could be gone really quickly. But then there are still great collections like yeah, a couple of days ago, Cobert was a decent one that you could flip then now what's it called the um, immortal players have done like a really nice run in the past 24 hours now retracing hard but so there are always opportunities and you just need to keep watching but i'm more of a secondary player nowadays because you need to be consistently putting an eat into the market consistently minting stuff knowing that there's a high chance of them just going straight to zero and I don't really like that part of the market. I don't really like just putting in, seeing your ETH stack just decrease. And um, But it's profitable for some people. There are people out there who are profiting. 
but I'm myself, I know that I'm, I'm not really made for this sort of market. So I'm just focusing on EAT. I was lucky enough to get out of EAT uh, at a decently higher price than it is now. And now I'm just watching it, see where, where what's a good point to be getting in there again really looking into the stock markets as well, looking for correlations, um, looking at currencies, um, all of trying to find all the links in the markets to see what time is going to do, because you could be buying an NFT. Like I've, I've constantly been watching the blue chips to see some longer term investment, as we've been speaking about, of those midterm investments, something that you're going to hold one or two months to go for a quick flip. But even if you bought, let's say, um, board apes a bit earlier at um, 65 to 70 ETH and then sold it a couple of days later for 70 to 80 ETH. The dollar profit on those was only like maybe $2,000 or something, maybe two to $5,000, whereas the ETH change, the difference in ETH price is maybe 20 ETH. And this recent price change has made me realize that the e the USD value of NFTs is way more important than the ETH value. Yes, we've always been speaking about the goal is to stack ETH, but the real goal is actually to stack USD. We've seen people buy board apes sub 40 ETH and they are now down like 60% on their investment which is just crazy in my opinion. Like when ETH was 40, uh, when, when board apes were 40 ETH, I think the price for um, an NFT was, what was it? ETH was, I don't know, more than 100,000 was the price back then, or roughly 100,000 for a board ape, or 120, I think, uh, for a board ape. Whereas now, the they are almost double in ETH value, but the USD price is almost half. So that, that just real, makes me realize that the USD value of an NFT is just something we often forget about and we just watch the ETH values because we always say the goal is stacking ETH, but the actual goal is stacking USD. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a big change in my mind recently. That's, that's a really good point that you're hitting on right now. And yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Because Let's just pull that apart for a second here because we've all heard what you're saying. And I think maybe this is just plain old... MBHQ value, you know, we, we can give maybe in picking this apart for a second, right, where thinking about why that, that's the case and why that, that concept's been mentioned before, right? And I think, of course, like, you know, dollars still exist, right? As much as we may or may not like the fiat system, whatever, they still exist. It's still what pays for groceries. It's still what's usable in most of the normal world. It's still how many people, some chunk of investors calculate the value and the ROI of their investments, right? Some may be on USDC or USD and some may be on ETH, right? But as a result of that, like to me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts here, but to me, this concept of stacking ETH, I, I actually happen to think that it's more of like an external, uh, yeah. external facing thing to say for the intent being of like keeping the Web3 Thank and you. NFT community okay, growing together, for lack of a better description, which is like, let's keep our eyes on ETH. Let's keep our eyes on NFTs. Knowing that if we all push together, right, as a community to grow Web3, create more awareness and all those good things, it will get that much more attention, that much more power. And that's, of course, then good for all of us, right? But but pragmatically, like you're suggesting, you know, U.S. dollars are still, the, you know, the standard or, or, you know, whatever the country's currency is, of course. But U.S. dollars and fiat are still the standard for how you pay for things on a day-to-day -day basis. So what do you, do you agree with that? What are your, what are your thoughts or reactions to that? Um, so I do believe that, like... I'm a big believer of crypto and stuff nowadays, and I do believe that one day it's going to uh, start running again, and maybe there's going to be like a big change, a big shift. We've seen this uh, financial system shift many times. We've seen once a certain coin loses value, we have the Romans with the gold coin, but then they started adding different particles and it was less, less, less gold. So the coin itself, the value went down. And that's when they changed from their currency system to a new one. And I do believe that now the, the next sort of move is going to be from fiat to crypto. But especially in current market, and I mean global market, the fiat is so important. We see the global market just being absolutely shit. Um, if I can put it that way, like we, we see um, 
geopolitical news being really bad we do see inflation going insanely high we we're going to be seeing like in increase in uh lo the loss of jobs we we see the housing market on the brick of uh breaking down completely and like all of these things makes it in the current time that fiat cash is king yeah. and that's why i nowadays have my focus on the the usd on the fiat on the euro wherever you're from so the fiat stuff is nowadays important but when the whole more, more general market settles down a little bit i do believe that we will see more of the the whole oh we, we live for eat it's going to change we we or btc or whatever crypto is going to take over uh but i do believe that the the vision now on that subject is a bit shifted because people are just right now looking to see how much have they got in their usd and also still that mr taxman is always going to be looking for your usd or your fiat spendings they're not going to check your eat profits uh, they're going to check your uh, fiat profits that you made with your eat yeah uh, so that's also a big thing but in the community in general we still talk about eat. We just we still uh, say, "Oh, I made this much this much eat on this flip." So there is still this this general feeling about crypto that we still talk in crypto. We still uh, just keep on talking about it, and that's what I like. But in general, when you go out, you still, as you said, you need to pay your your groceries with fiat. So that's and especially in this current bearish market global bearish market i think the the fiat is a bit more important but in the communities in our crypto communities in our nft communities we still talk in those cryptocurrencies because that's yeah. our goal yeah you know it's kind of funny also about what you're saying to some extent which is like this this split that exists between like many of us in here and otherwise being flippers, right? Meaning like we're, we're just minting and flipping in a very, very tight time horizon, right? But the contrast of that with Stack ETH, which really what's what's being said there is Stack ETH because in the future it's going to be 10K plus, but that, that's like nowhere near now. So it's this, it's funny contrast between like short-term mindset and the fact that you're stacking something for the long-term as well. It's, it's a pretty funny combination. Um, one other thing you said too that I, I, want, I do want to touch on that I think is interesting to pull apart and we don't have to go deep into this, but like, you know, just maybe a comment or two, which is the concept of safer, because you said, you know, I prefer secondary because it's it's safer. Right. But, you know, I, I think the definition of safer could could be expanded to be pretty wide there, actually. Right. And the, early on, I think it was the first episode, actually, we had Shaggy on. And this was actually before, interestingly enough, before most of you know, the issues that we had with Terra and, you know, all those those problems and rug pulls and, and issues like that. And we were kind of talking, we kind of talked about a spectrum, basically, where on one end of the spectrum is fiat, the other end of the spectrum is like NFTs. And we kind of made a very explicit point of saying how stable coins are not at the same point in the spectrum as USD, right? Because there's a couple layers of risk that exist, including, you know, uh, some of the stuff that we've seen, technology risk, hack risk, like all that kind of stuff, right? And what's interesting is, as you were talking about safer, why you like secondary instead of instead of direct, I think also there's like a few hidden, not hidden, but not talked about a lot layers of risk that have to be incorporated there into, you know, choosing between primary minting and secondary. So, for example, um, you know, you may like secondary, right, because it's it's a, it's a wider time horizon and therefore you don't have to rush as much. You can analyze better. Of course, on top of that, right, there is. The risk of moving really fast and, you know, clicking a bad link, of course, or having it be a rug pull or like a whole variety of other issues that exist because you have to move really fast. And because you're minting 10, 20, 50 different projects from a an unknown source. So uh, is that part of your calculation in there? Or are there any other risks that you see, Linko, that you're mentally factoring in as to why you prefer secondary? The, the term second or the term safer is a bit of a... Uh, it also depends on who you are. For me, it's safer also. One of the reasons why I use the word safer because um, I it's more in my field of business. I, I like to watch graphs and I 
I think of myself that I can see a top or a bottom pretty well nowadays. So I find it safer than just blindly minting a project and hoping that it will do fine. But then there's also the other aspect of safer for mints. Let's say you're minting always and you're just waiting for those random mints to pop up where you have to react very fast on it. You need to have eat ready. And in my position nowadays, I prefer to keep my... Uh, my net worth into fiat and if ah. you want to mint you're in eat and then you have the risk of eat going up or down up would obviously be good but there's also still the greater risk of eat still dropping lower uh, which i think is a possibility that's still on the table but that's the first layer of risk and so you you are already speculating on, okay, I just have some ETH, uh, it could go down, it could go up, but then you're just minting, you're not knowing, uh, often, of the, a lot of the times you don't know if it's like a rug pull, if it's something decent, if it's not. Um, so that's the second sort of risk into it on top of the ETH price changing. And if you're doing secondary, you can sort of watch the graph and then say, okay, I'll just quickly transfer some uh, fiat, some uh, stables into um, into ETH, and then I'll look into buying at a certain price point that I think is decent or where I think it will go up from there. So that's, in my opinion, uh, like two layers of safety, uh, sort of say. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely something to it, but. Obviously, as you say, we can also watch. Uh, we can also watch the aspect of safe, like risk management of being USD fiat, yeah. USDC, for example, for stable coins. Then you can also have your your stable farming, and then you have your crypto, and then you have the NFTs, and yeah. those are all like from less risk to more risk. So your um, your fiat is sort of sort of safe you still have banks that can go broke like you can have uh, um um uh, the word is uh, slipping my mind but still have uh, bank systems we've seen it before like real world banks that go broke and that have to uh that are not able to re repay their customers and that's something that we have been seeing nowadays in a lot of these platforms. We've seen some speculation with BlockFi, we've seen Voyager, uh, we've seen, what was the other one, uh, something like U-Hodler, but another version of it. We've seen Celsius. Uh, those are what you could describe as virtual banks or what we thought were somewhat safe virtual banks. And we've seen them going broke nowadays and not being able to repay their uh, customers back. So that's an, like another risk management layer where yep. people nowadays like to keep their money in their hardware wallets um, or on bigger exchanges. Um, but yeah, th those are some layers of risk. And then yep. the next layer of risk is just crypto in general, speculating yep. on crypto. And then if people are too afraid to invest in crypto, they will most definitely be too afraid to invest in NFTs because sure. that's on top of crypto. Yep. Sort of say yeah. that's the whole safety to risk uh, spectrum a bit, in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's really great. That's a great layout, and I, I'm going to try to make everyone a bit comfortable here before I'm I'm going to pull a takeaway out of here that I'm hearing at least. But I mean, I, I am not a good trader. I just want to be very very clear with that. So if anybody doesn't feel like they're an excellent trader. Um, that's totally cool, right? I mean, it, it's learnable skill sets and all those good things. But what I keep hearing from Linko, and I think is a just a very important thing to take away, he's he's one of the better traders that exists out there, and he's treating things in in US, you know, USDC or US dollar denominated fashion, right? So what does that mean? That means really, you know, I think in here we're all, you know, for the most part, very good traders, you know, very good flippers, whatever else, you know, got that part down and we're always improving and working on that craft and all those good kinds of things but not incorporating and not accounting for the underlying crypto risk by holding eth is missing part of the puzzle in terms of your margin and maybe even influencing you making the best decisions possible right so it kind of suggests to me that for anybody in here learning how to be able to to factor in eth price for instance or crypto in general but eth price is like a second skill set that's really, really important to be able to maximize. And again, full transparency, I am not very good with technical analysis and that's not my skill set. So just trying to 
get experts on here, of course, to make it helpful for everybody. But that's a big thing that I feel like I'm hearing hearing from you, Linko, right now, and um, and definitely maybe you know it can help somebody in here, hopefully. So, um, so in the in the current time, then you know th there is a handful of things to be able to analyze, right? Like you can analyze the macro markets, you can analyze individual um, NFT projects, crypto, et cetera. I, I'm not saying you, you necessarily have like a very precise process for this, but how do you make a decision? Because you only have so much time, like what's worth spending the time to analyze versus what's not? Like do you have basically an initial hint that something might be worth spending the time and therefore you have like a reason you want to analyze it? Are you bigger on just creating process where you like think about that for a while, set up a structure like you have your daily data analysis? And go with that like how do you think about that in, in dividing your time for analysis um so the main thing as i said i mainly focus on on crypto nowadays but if i'm watching for nfts i wait for a project to at least reach um like 0 0.1 eat and once it looks like it's going to break the 0 0.1 ETH, then i i look for maybe getting into it maybe sweeping the loss to break the 0 0.1 because usually there is then a chance that it runs to 0 0.15 or if it's decent, at least to 0 0.2, as we've seen with the co pairs. And then sometimes there's potential from there to even go to like um, 0 0.4, as we've seen with the immortal players. Excuse me, a little cough incoming. But like, I wait for the 0 0.1 because sub 0 0.1, even like, there is a chance that if you sweep the 0 0.01 and you go all the way to 0 0.05 and that's uh, that's just like, okay, there's potential that it is better, but anything that has not broken, in my opinion, the 0 0.1 uh, or 0 0.5 to 0 0.1, it's not really worth the risk if you sweep at 0 0.01, you still have to pay gas for it, which almost doubles your cost. And then you also have the royalties. Of course, royalties at that price point is almost negligible. But there needs to be so much volume nowadays to go from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05. And some, most of the times it doesn't even breach it. There's a chance that it goes to 0 0.03. But if you swept 0 0.01, there you are almost break even or going for like a couple dollar profits. Uh, and that's just not, in my opinion, worth currently my time or risk management to um, to go for those minimal trades. So I just wait for the more uh, bigger project that seem to have a bit of a run up. So if they're, they are approaching 0 0.1 and that's what I'm watching on the fire and like NFT nerds fire hose. Um, if I see some sweeps coming in, because I also I always have the, the sweep section open of the Discord and then or of Mobis looking at the sweeps, looking at what notable wallets do, and then the fire hose so that I can see, okay, what are people buying? Oh, this price is getting into the range where I need to pay attention to it. And so I wait for that, and that already filters out, let's say 90% of the projects. And so I just have this on the side, which takes almost zero effort to keep an eye on. And then when, once it gets into my uh, eye, then I just, open it up and put it on my main screen to just watch to see what's going on. And this is the short term flips, then the medium term flips for a couple of weeks, couple of months. Uh, those I keep track of with my morning updates. Um, each time that I do my morning update, I can see which blue chips or which more established projects have gone up in price, have gone down in price. I keep in mind uh, once every couple of weeks, I open a parsec, I set out some uh, key levels for blue chips. And when they approach those key levels, which I've written down in a notepad on my monitor, um, then I start paying attention to the project. And then I start thinking, okay, what's the current ETH price? What's this in USD value? How is this comparing to a couple of weeks ago? How is this comparing to all time highs? And so that's how I keep track of the more longer term uh, flips. That's then, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please, please. 
then I go over to the crypto side of things uh, for my morning updates and each time how I start my days, I go clear my chart and I put new key levels in. I put, I look at the previous day and I see, okay, daily high, daily low, daily, like what's the support? What are the four hour um, biggest resistance and supports? And I watch, okay, is this breaking anything on the daily time frame? What am I looking for? Are we still in a bear flag? Are we um, in an uptrend? And that's, I also sort of implement in my morning updates. And then during the day, I have always, um, always just a, a lot of screens open with uh, the five minute time frames. I have the five minute of ETH, five minute of BTC, five minute of the NASDAQ, five minute of the S&P. And this is my main top monitor that just always has it open. I have the normal chart and then I have the, the Heiken Ashi chart as well below it with the uh, market cipher. And as I, I wait for the trades, I wait till these four hour and daily key levels get reached. And that's when I start paying attention. I put some uh, alerts on there that if we approach those key levels, that I get an alert on my phone and then I, I get a I focus up. I close my game that I'm playing or something. I close the video that I'm watching and I focus up. I, I see, okay, are we approaching this level? What do my indicators say? What's the RSI saying? What's the MACD saying? What's the stochastic RSI saying? What are the other graphs saying? Because you all know each is correlated to BTC. BTC is correlated to S&P 500, to the NASDAQ. How are they correlated to the USD, like the, the Dixie, the USD index? Um, are they all topping out? Uh, is there a topping out on the NASDAQ? So we know that BTC will probably top out as well and that it will retrace as well, maybe a little bit. I get into it real close. Like those, when once we hit those daily levels, that's when I start looking into the minute time frames, the three minute and the five minute. And that's when I enter my, if, if it all looks great, that's when I enter a short or a long. And those are the trades that I'm in for, let's say maybe 15 minutes. And I don't go for insane profits. This is something that I've always done with NFTs as well. I go for the secure profits. Uh, I'm still learning this. Uh, I'm, I have some experience in coin training, but I think about myself that I'm still learning. Even though I, in my last 20 trades, I've made um, 18 profitable trades. And out of the two negative trades, one of them is because even though the buttons are green for long, red for short, I misclicked on a button. And uh, it's stupid as it is, that's one of my uh, bad trades that I've made. So even with this 90% uh, correct rate on basically on my trades, I always take the profit of the 1% I play with 10x leverage, nothing too big, nothing too small either. But 1% move, 10% on my investment, I take the profit. I just made, and why do I just take this? Well, it's Coin trading is infinitely scalable. Nowadays, I'm just playing with a smaller bag. I'm just playing with a couple hundred dollars. And um, 1%, okay, I just made $20. It is what it is. And I'm just learning it. I'm just learning more and more, getting more confident. I do set out levels for myself. I say, okay, I think the first price is going to retrace to this level. And this is where I would take 50 or 75% of the profit. And then I think the price will retrace more or go up more. And that's when I take the rest of my profit. And even though I set out these levels and most of the time these levels get hit, once I reach the 1% price change, I take the profit because I'm right now going for secure profits and learning experience. And even though I, if I trade with $200, with $2,000, even with $20,000, 1% stays with 10x leverage, 10% of your investment. So if you play with $200 at $20 that you just made 2,000, you just made $200 in 15 minutes, 20,000, you just made $2,000 also within those 15 minutes so it's infinitely scalable so if you get your system down you can make your monthly wage in a 15 minute trade in a day for example you just need to get your system down know that it's almost always correct and even if it's not correct once you know that most of the time it will be correct and you will make up for your maybe one bad trade that week but that's how i've been doing that's how i've been going over nfts and crypto trading during my days. Wow. That's, that's so, so good, man. Thank you for pulling that back and sharing exactly how you set up everything and thinking about it in your process and all that stuff. So, so good. If anybody else listening 
is feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now because you're like, oh shit, I get, yeah, we probably do have our work to do, myself included, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, but it's really good to be able to see what the process is like and tools and all those good kinds of things. So I'm just going to take a, a two second pause right now just to shout out. Um, you know, we're getting closer on time. We've got Linko captive here. He is stuck in here for at least a little bit longer. Uh, if you have questions, you know, we have them captive. Now would be the time to, to make sure to fire it in to make sure that we can get your question in. So beginner questions, you know, if, if there's something you're curious about, or even if it's more advanced, we'll at least try. So uh, just drop that into guest questions if you have anything. Um, so Linko, you know, at the current state that we're at right now, you mentioned, you know, the macro situation is obviously a little bit banged up. It hasn't quite settled, let's call it, right? It's a little bit, you know, even if you think we're close to the bottom, it's still choppy and you know, all those good kinds of things. Uh, where do you think, where do you think we're heading from an NFT standpoint, right? I mean, it's very easy for people right now, you know, in here, we're obviously a little bit biased, but people, you know, in general might be a little bit nervous, of course, right? I mean, there's, there's always fraud, of course, that exists, even if we, even if we believe in the technology. Where do you think the NFT market's heading? And like, you know, do you have any thoughts in terms of time horizon, even if it's rough? Like, what are your thoughts about that? So main, my main issue right now, not really with NFTs, but just in general, is people are afraid to invest into crypto now because the overall market is, as we said, a bit choppy. Uh, people have lost a bit of faith in it all. And if they are afraid to invest in crypto, they're afraid to invest their crypto into NFTs. And uh, right now, like people don't, as we've seen, and we used to think, oh, it's going down. This means that NFTs will boom. But actually this is the wrong correlation. It It's when ETH is going horizontal, that NFTs will boom when there is almost no money to be made in price going up or down. That's when people will go and look to NFTs because they're bored of the coin because it doesn't move a lot. And then they'll start looking to use their ETH or to use their coins to do something else. And I think that's when NFTs will start booming. So we need price to be steady. Right now, price is so choppy. We can wake up and be 10, 15% up from the day before or even an hour before. And, and as long as this is going on, I think we will remain in the decrease of volume. As we've seen in the past few days, we have just been decreasing insanely in OpenSea volume, LuxRare volume for NFTs. And I think that's the main reason. So... I think, um, just my personal opinion, I do, don't think the bottom is in yet for um, crypto in general. I do still think we will have a next rundown, leg down, and that's when I will start uh, dollar cost averaging in from that point on. And I hope that once that is hit, once this next leg down is hit, and we are maybe in a steady horizontal, even if this is maybe at $600 ETH or $1,600 ETH, as long as it's going horizontal, I think that's the moment when people will start going back into NFTs. That's when we will see a uh, volume getting back into NFTs. We'll see more blue chips getting bought up, other coins, other um, NFT projects, mint, uh, mint again, and just see everything boom again. But until this is hit, I, I think this could even be, we're speaking about weeks here, maybe even months in my opinion, before we will start seeing this correction again. Because the main issue, we've had bear markets in crypto, but we've never had a bear market in crypto while the general market was in a bear market. The last real general bear market for the overall market was in 2008. The one before was 2001. Crypto didn't even exist in 2008 yet. So we've had our retraces, our bear markets in crypto already, but we've never had our bear market in a bear market, if that makes sense. So that's the main thing that I'm scared for still. And unless we see overall horizontal movement or a steady uptrend, or just, just in general, like steady, same price movement, uh, either it's going slowly up or it's going slowly horizontal. 
until that point, I think we will see uh, NFT volume maybe even declining, maybe even going uh, as low as it is horizontal, but not really any big changes. And I think this could be even like weeks to months out still before we see something really happening again. Maybe what we need is a next big catalyst. We, we, we've seen Azuki was a big one at the beginning of the year. We've seen um, Moonbirds, another big one, other side, another big one, other side, maybe calling the ending of the NFT market uh, recently. But we need something like this to be, the, we need the next AAA project to do something. And right now the problem is that no big company Right now, no no AAA team is really looking at NFTs because the overall market is so shit. They're probably trying to save their company right now or see how they can uh, limit the damage to their company right now and not really thinking of, oh, we should start maybe start investing our time into the metaverse. Maybe we have a few employees who are not doing anything at the moment. We could put them on the metaverse project. No, right now they are looking at, mm, who should we cut to... Um, to save our, our team, for example, right now, or save our, our company. So I think that's a big problem right now. And until we see a big catalyst or we see the horizontal, steady, comfy price movement, that's when, un until then, that's when we will see like the NFTs boom again, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. I, I think I agree with um, pretty much everything you're saying. And, you know, I, I think something that I've discussed with people before too, I think with you also, but with people before is like, I would almost rather have a medium quality project that's perfectly timed than a really good project that's like poorly timed, right? I mean, if, if it's riding in a wave where like the macroeconomic situation is good and people are money and they're trusting crypto and that narrative is really good, I would probably take a medium quality project over a really, really good quality one at the wrong time. And so for, for that reason, like you're saying, you know, many of these projects are probably thinking similarly too, not just like, do we have to remove, you know, uh, staff or do we have to manage our money appropriately or whatever it is and manage burn? But also, if we have anything that we're going to announce, now might not be the time you want to announce it because we'll be flying solo, right? Like we're going to be flying into a headwind by ourselves, right? Not, not even without like the power of other projects doing it at the same time. So, yeah, that makes complete sense what you're saying. And I think the other insight, too, is like you were saying, we've never seen, uh, you know, a, a crypto bear market with a macro bear market as well. And that kind of suggests to me that anything we've seen data wise in the past about like cycles, cycles are every three years, four years, three, whatever it is, or cycles are going to tighten, you know, it kind of has to be treated separately, right? And this is just a different circumstance right now that has to be treated completely separately, it feels like. So, um, and I think that's, that's what I hear you saying, if I'm hearing you right. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, We've got about a minute or two left. Um, if anybody has questions, now would be the final time. Although I think Linko gave us everything on earth. So I'm not surprised we have limited questions today because he really, really just gave it to us, which was awesome. Um, Linko, any other final thoughts or comments about the markets or for anyone trying to get sharper that you think would be useful? I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if you had not much left. You shared a whole lot today. But if you have any other final thoughts... <laughs> Um, I would say like the main thing, if you don't know um, what to do nowadays, um, I would focus on studying, learning yourself, like take your time right now. If you miss a mint, it's not the end of the world. Like right now we are all looking to survive instead of like make it, make general wealth. We're, there is a chance you can make general wealth in the next few days, weeks, but the chance of it is rather low compared to when we're in the bull market. So I would suggest like people, if they don't know anything of their, if they've been telling themselves like, oh, I always wanted to get into analyzing or I always wanted to get become a developer or something, whatever it can be, or uh, want to do something for a project team or advice or whatever it may be. Now is the time to hone your skills. Now is the time to start learning, start building, start learning how to code, start learning how to, to trade whatever it is that you want to do. I think if you've been putting it off because of the bull market and because of the active uh, NFTs that's been going on or NFT NYC maybe, um, I think now could be a great moment to just get behind the books, get behind, watch some videos on how to do it, start getting into it. 
And yeah, and if it's anything like NF, like crypto related, NFT related, analytic related, or whatever it may be, or if you're in your current job and you think of making a switch or something, always feel free to DM me. I'm always open to help as well. That's awesome, Linka. Um, such a such a good conversation. Always love chatting with you and talking about theoretical and all that good stuff. Um, so really, really good. Um, I will try and to convince you to make a bet at some point. I'm confident by the time we get Linko on again that we will have a bet in place for something weird. It's going to happen. I know he's measured, but at some point we're going to do it. And we're going to make it a fair bet, so we'll try to make it happen. But otherwise, I'll break at much. one point. <laughs> I'll convince you. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for joining. Just one last comment to everybody, which is um, if you have anybody who you'd like to have on Numbers Therapy that you have as a suggestion for a specific topic, or if you even think you'd have an interesting topic to, you know, to come on here for, uh, just send me a DM and we can always discuss it and see if there's a way to frame it the right way, all those good kinds of things. Um, you know, we kind of have a sheet where we, where we plan out, of course, but always looking for new interesting people and, and what their hook is. And uh, th that's the whole point, right, is to showcase folks in here. So thanks so much for everybody joining. Thanks, Linko. Awesome, awesome time today. And we'll see you next week at the usual time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for having me. It was, was a blast. And yeah, for sure. See you guys maybe next time. For sure. It was awesome, Linko.